Statistics, hypothesis testing, T distribution, two tail, where the standard deviation of the population is not known. Get ready and some coffee, because if we want to get realistic, we need statistics and Excel. You're not required to. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one, because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But... But that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunchy numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. But if you have access to this OneNote file, we're currently in the OneNote presentation section, 1986 hypothesis testing T distribution to tail STDP not known tab. This scenario being similar to recent example problems, except this time, we have hypothesis testing instead of confidence intervals, T distribution instead of normal distribution, two tail situation instead of a one tail upper or a one tail lower, where the standard deviation of the population is not known, which is one of the reasons we use a T distribution as opposed to a normal distribution, which we will discuss more shortly. But the similarities are that we want to find information about a large population. We can't test every item within the large population. So, of course, we're going to take a sample, test the sample, hoping we can find or apply the findings found from the sample to the characteristics of the larger population. Two methods for doing this typically, one being hypothesis testing, two being the confidence intervals. When we're thinking about confidence intervals, it lends itself to situations where we really don't know what the middle point is. Therefore, our strategy is to take the sample and then take the mean or middle point of the sample, put that at the middle and build our confidence interval around it in some way, shape or form. Whereas hypothesis testing, which is what we will be doing, is where we often know what the middle point is or ought to be possibly. We build our hypothesis around that and then we do the sample and see how far away the result or mean or average of the sample is to the hypothesized amount and see if we have enough evidence to reject the original hypothesis the hypothesis, therefore, being structured in a similar way as a United States criminal court case, for example, in which case, oftentimes, the reason there is a case is because there is some suspicion of guilt here. Some crime uh, might have been committed, but we structure the process as though innocent until proven guilty, meaning the presumption of innocence is like our null hypothesis. And then we gather the evidence, which would be similar to our sample here, to see if the preponderance of the evidence, in our case, the mean of all the sample data, is far enough away from our hypothesized value that we can reject the original hypothesis, innocence in the court case situation, or the middle number in the case of our hypothesis, and then uh, reject the hypothesis based on that. Now, there's two uh, things to keep in mind here as well. One, do we have normal distribution situation or when do we need to use a T distribution, which is basically going to be a little bit different of a graph, but have much of the same uh, concepts to it. And two, what is this business with the tails, one tail versus a two tail distribution? So let's first just imagine we had a similar a situation with a normal distribution, which is what we normally think of with our bell curve, which we would normally do if we knew what the standard deviation of the population was and or possibly we had a large enough sample to make sure that the central limit theorem is kicking in so that we can use our bell-shaped 
kind of curve. So usually then we would say within the X can be measured in terms of whatever units we're measuring in. In our case, we're gonna be seeing how long it times takes to produce something. We're gonna call it production hours. So we have X in hours. We have X then in either T's or Z's, both representing standard deviations. When we think about standard deviations, then we typically would have the middle point here that would be based upon the, the hypothesized value. And then we normally would have like two standard deviations on either side possibly, which would be like around here, two standard deviations, doot, doot. And that would be that 95% or area of the curve, 95% are gonna be in the middle. I don't know what it did. It tried to think that I was building like a, like a something around that. Anyways, 95% around the middle. And then we would have like 5% in the two tails, which would be evenly distributed given the symmetry of the graph. 2.5 on uh, both sides would be the general idea. Now we can imagine a situation where we want to know just about one tail. We want to know, for example, do we produce more widgets under a new process or with a new machine than the old machine? In that case, we would have a one tail type of distribution. Or we can imagine a situation where we're trying to see if a process takes more or less time. Does the new process take less time than the old process? In that case, we might have a one tail to the left because we're interested in the situation of it being taking less time. Or we might have a situation as we do here that we have production hours and we want to know what the average production hours are so that we can possibly properly budget. And therefore, I want to know if we're off on the high end or the low end, which is going to result in our two tail distribution. We don't know if we're too high. We don't know if we're too low. We have a two tail type distribution, which means when we choose our whatever number we're going to choose for both of these tails, then we're going to have to divide it by two because it's going to be the area is going to be evenly distributed between both, which in this case, instead of using the normal 5%, we're going down to 1%, which is going to give us a higher degree of confidence. We then have the idea of T distributions versus normal distributions. The normal distribution is what we would normally use if we knew what the standard deviation of the population is. But if we don't know that, then we might go to the T distributions, which have the similar graph shape, but they have wider tails. And that means if there are wider tails, that if I wanted to get 95% of the area in the middle, I would have to have standard deviations greater than around two or 1.96, right? I'd have to have a larger range which makes sense because the larger range is going to give us kind of like more confidence uh, is the general idea. So in our case, we don't know what the standard deviation is. Therefore, we're going to use T distributions instead of normal distributions. T distributions have actually multiple graphs related to them based on what we call the degrees of freedom, which is basically based on the sample size minus the number of samples. And so, and if we get to like 100, of the degrees of freedom, which would not be that huge of a sample size, depending on what we're doing, then the T distribution graphs are going to get pretty close to the normal distribution. In this case, we're going to use 75, which means the T distribution graphs are still going to be somewhat close, you would think, to the normal distributions, the tails thinning out as the degrees of freedom gets larger. All right, that's our baseline. Let's erase all this. Let's go back and see what we got. What do we got? We've got then uh, the T distribution. We're gonna say production hours are 9,500 and the standard deviation of the population we're gonna say is not known to start off with. Uh, so the question is gonna be on this production process, we think that it takes 9,500. That's what we're budgeting, let's say, in our company based upon. So now we want to do an audit and say, is that number right? So we're not saying, we're not trying to assume in this case, whether it's too high or too low. We're not coming in with a presumption to say, I have a better process that takes more time or less time or whatever. We are instead saying, this is what we're putting in as the time it takes. Let's test if it's correct or not. 
So that's why it's a two-tail situation. So we're going to say the null hypothesis, we're going to assume is correct, meaning that it does take around 9,500. And then the alternative is going to be, the alternative will be the thing if the null is incorrect, meaning it takes either more or substantially less time than the 9,500. All right. So we're first going to build out our data. So once again, uh, in practice, of course, we might have multiple amount we might be doing this process like all the time uh in practice if it's something that we do for our business we might not have a finite number or population to draw from but in our practice problem we want to see the population so that i can actually see the actual data and then pull from that actual data so that we have an an idea of both the population and the information pulled so we would generate this in excel i'm going to I'm going to point out how we do it in Excel. We do this problem in Excel in another course or section, but it's going to be a lot longer and we'll focus more time on formatting Excel in there. For here, I'll just point out how you might structure this in Excel. So we're going to build our data with a population of 9,700. Notice that that's not exactly the middle point of 9,500, but it's somewhat uh, close, right? So it's not, it's not way off of the 9,005. We have the 2,450, which is going to be the standard deviation or the measure of spread. We're going to use the data analysis tool to calculate this in Excel. And if you don't know what that is or don't have it turned on in Excel, you can look up how to do that on YouTube or whatever, or wherever you look it up, chat GTP. We're going to do a random number generation. And then we randomly generated numbers of a uh, very a number of variables one i think i only did 500 not 5000 but we did it around a normal distribution and then with a mean 9700 standard deviation 2450 and it spit out then these numbers now so this is the number i grab now if i was to graph this information it would probably be in terms of a histogram something that should be around a center amount of this and have somewhat of an approximation of a bell-shaped curve remembering that if i don't know the standard deviation of the population then especially if my sample size is fairly small i would hope that my actual data has a bell-shaped curve to it because then it's more likely that my my results will be accurate based on the bell-shaped curve even if the central limit theorem doesn't kick in in other words Normally, we think that that we're, we could still use the bell-shaped curve because of the central limit theorem, which would mean that we would have to have a sample size large enough for the central limit theorem to kick in. If not, then we still might be able to use the same process, but it would be better if the actual data were bell-shaped, which in this case, it most likely would be because if we're seeing how long it takes to do something, usually we'll have a middle point and somewhat of a standard deviation spread around it if we were to plot that out. All right, so let's take the actual data. So this is what we use to create the data. This is the actual data population mean. If I take the average of all of these numbers, which I didn't print all of them out here, but if I took the average, it would be the average function, pretty close, 9,700 to 9,741. Standard deviation, which would be this function, standard deviation dot P of the population, pretty close, 2,518, a little high for that one, 2,450. The count, how many data points do we have? 500. So we're gonna imagine we tested this, or we haven't tested this, we're gonna imagine this is the population of 500 that gives us our actual data. Now we're gonna we're gonna imagine now we're in universe and we're doing the test. So so we're gonna say we have samples and we're gonna take 75 test processes, which in practice, of course, we're gonna actually look up the data or run the tests uh, of of 75 of them. In Excel, we want to imagine that these 500 numbers are the population and we're going to pull 75 from them how would we do that well these were randomly generated so i could just take the first 75 but i also might want to shuffle them which means i could put a column of random numbers next to it and then sort by the new column of numbers that are randomly generated shuffling these numbers like a deck of cards 
or I can use an index function, which is what we did here, taking index of this, of this set of numbers, and then I wanna take a random between, and then this represents the one in 500, the rows. So randomly select rows and it gives me these numbers. Now in Excel, this will actually keep on shuffling every time I double click on it, which is kind of neat because then I can, I can refresh my random generated numbers multiple times and run in essence, no, multiple different scenarios that way very quickly. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at our, re, we're gonna retype our hypothesis with symbols. So H sub zero, H naught you might say, of mu, which is the mean uh, of the population equals 9,500. That's what we're assuming. That's what we've been using in our budgeting, even though we know from behind the scenes that the actual amount is 9,700. It's 9,741 from the population, but they don't know that in universe, right? We're using 9,500 as our estimated time. And so it equals that. And then we're gonna say that the H sub A, the alternative of mu, the average time is not equal to, which often would be represented with an equal sign and a cross through it. But in Excel, because we don't really have that symbol, it would be an added symbol. We have, this will be the not equal, not equal to 9,500. So it's a two tier test. So that means that the, that you're gonna have an equal on the hypothesis and not equal, meaning it might be up on the high end or on the low end, low end or high end, uh, uh, if, if we're gonna reject it. We could reject it on either end. All right, so we're gonna say, let's get our numbers broken out here. Alpha is gonna be 0 0.01. Now that's a high degree of confidence right there. So that means that if I look at my graph over here, when we graph this out, we're gonna say that the mean is in the middle and then we only have 0.01 in the end. If this was a normal distribution, 95% of the data would be within two standard deviations and that means that we would have 5% on the ends. Right now, 1% on the ends means that we have like 0.05 on each of these sides, which is which means that we're gonna have, to have a large threshold to clear in order for us to reject the uh, original hypothesis. All right, so then we're gonna say the number of samples, we just did a count. We counted the, the, the number that we generated. How many of these do we have? 75 so we ran 75 tests the degrees of freedom the degrees of freedom is used when we do t-testing not in a normal distribution situation because the degrees of freedom tell excel which graph are we going to use meaning you're going to have different t distribution graphs based on the degrees of freedom which will have wider tails the lower the degrees of freedom number is as the degrees of freedom gets higher, which above 50 is getting fairly high for these graphs, 75, 74 is pretty high. When you get to 100, you're getting a graph that has tails that are pretty thin, pretty similar, getting more and more similar to like a normal distribution. It's calculated by taking N, which is the sample size, minus the number of samples. In this case, we only did one sample. Therefore, sample size 75 minus one is 74. X bar. That's the average. So remember our data here, we have the average of the data. That's what we're looking for, which we approximated or hypothesized to be uh, 9,500. That's the hypothesis, but the actual data, where did it go? The actual data has a mean of 9,741, which we don't know then we take the mean we have we're looking we also have the mean of the sample which we do know this number hopefully tends towards the mean of the population and we can also imagine that this graph over here is going to be built on the concept of the hypothesized mean and the standard deviation not of the population not of the of the sample but the standard deviation as though we imagine we take all combinations the mean of all combinations of sample size 75, which we do with a formula.
So you could also imagine from the mean standpoint that we take the average of all possible means of combinations of sample 75, all of the means should tend towards the same middle point, the mean of the population. It's the standard deviations that get a little funny. So the standard deviations, once again, we have the standard deviation of the population, which in this case, we're imagining we do not know it. And then we have the standard deviation of the sample, which is what we are calculating here. That was the average. And that's gonna be the standard deviation of the sample, uh, which should approximate the standard deviation of the population, 2014 versus 2450. That's pretty close. But if we had a small sample, then it might not be that close, right? It might be a little bit further off, which is why uh, we would use T distributions to kind of compensate for that a little bit, right? Which has the fatter tails. Okay, but the actual standard deviation we use in the graph is not this standard deviation. It's the standard deviation of the mean of all combinations of sample size 75 within the population in our case of 500, which we approximate with a formula. So that's gonna be the standard error. So this is basically the standard deviation that we actually use in the spread of the, of the bell curve. Formula to calculate it. Did I add it here? No, it's gonna be, I'll just tell you the formulae. It's gonna be then usually the standard deviation of the population if we knew it, but we don't. Therefore, we approximate it with the standard deviation of the sample, in this case, 2004, uh, 14 divided by the square root of the sample size 75 not the not the degrees of freedom the sample size so that gives us our standard error and then we've got the t test what is the t test now remember that our graph is built off of the idea that the middle point is the 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 hypothesized amount and then we did the test and we came up to our own x which is slightly different, I believe it's gonna be slightly higher, right? And so now we have a slightly higher X. So I have two X val or bars down here or two, two X numbers, which one represents time, I believe it's in hours, and the other represents the standard deviations. So I wanna see how far away our result is from the hypothesized amount measured in standard deviations, which if it was a normal distribution would be in Z's, but now is in T's because we're using T distributions. So how would I do that? We could say, all right, we would just take the X, this is what we got, 9464 in our sample, minus what we hypothesized, which is the middle of the graph, 9,500. There's a difference of 36 in hours, but we wanna look at it in standard deviation or T's, so we divide it by the, the standard error, which is the standard deviation used in the graph, 278.77, and we get about uh, 0.1285, 1285. So it's actually less than, uh, we got a number less than, that's interesting, because the actual population was higher. But anyway, so we're going to say that's going to be th that number. So that means that if we look at, the middle point on the graph, it should be at 9,500. And then our amount was 9,464, which should be equivalent to 0.1285 standard deviations. So uh, let's just point, point 0.1285 standard deviations is like somewhere around here, which was 9,000. 165 or so, 9,464, right? So somewhere around here, 9,000. Okay, I had that wrong. It's, it's more like over here. So it's more like in between these two. So once again, that's at, in X is 9,464 and T's 0.1285. So somewhere 9464.12. So I, <laughs> I think I have it within here. So it's pretty close to the middle point, which is at which would be at zero, right? So clearly it's not anywhere near the tails. So it doesn't look like we're going to be rejecting it, right? But let's do it more formally and kind of think it through. Say, okay, well, what does that mean? Uh, let's go and let's erase that dot. 
that's going to bug me. Get out of here, dot. And then we'll go back and say, okay, so then let's do our p value. All right, so the p value represents uh, represents the area under the curves, right? So the p value is the area under the curve, but we're looking for the area under the curve based on our uh, our number here. So it's going to be the area both on the left and the right in like a two-tailed type of situation versus the area under the curve, which is 0.01, which is a very small amount. And if our p-value is greater than that, 0.01, then uh, we then uh, no reject. We do not reject. All right, so the calculation is going to be 1 minus the t distribution because we're looking at one of the tails. So 1 minus uh, the t distribution of x which is going to be then X is actually this amount, the T, and then the degrees of freedom, which is the 74, which is sample size minus the samples, which is one, and then comma one, meaning we want it to be cumulative. And then I have to take that entire thing and multiply it uh, times two, because we're trying to get both sides in the two tail uh, situation. So notice we get to uh, one point uh, 1.10, which is, of course, way bigger than uh, the 0 0.01, which is kind of an unusual calculation because normally you think it'd be under one. But in any case, that you, there's also a, a t.dist.2t where I would use the x and the degrees of freedom. That's another way that you can calculate this uh, in Excel. And then if we go to the critical value, then we think about the critical value what are the points uh, that we have to cross for the uh, critical value? We've got the, if I think about it, 2.64, just think about it over here. So recall that the middle point is going to be then the, the uh, where, where the where the hypothesized amount is. If it was a normal distribution, and we were going to say that we want 95% of the data in the middle and 5% on the ends, then you would have around two standard deviations or 1.696 uh, or so. But in this case, we have a T distribution, which has a little bit of a fatter tails, but not too much fatter because it's a fairly large uh, degrees of freedom. And then we only have one uh, in the tails. So that means this is like 0.05. So we're way out here. So you would expect this to be, a, a, you know, further out like 2.6 or so and 2.6, you know, or so on this side. So how do we calculate that? That's the hurdle that we would have to clear, which we're nowhere near in terms of T's or standard deviations, uh, which used to be in Z's if it was a normal distribution. So we would take the equals T dot inverse, and then we're picking up this amount divided by two, we're dividing by two because uh, we have a two-tailed situation and then comma, the degrees of freedom are the 74, that gets us to that negative 2.64. Now to get the positive, because we're talking about an equivalent amount, then the, we just take negative of that number would be on uh, the positive side. Now we can also calculate this in Excel. There's another formula to do the same thing. And it's, it's uh, I took negative of to get the negative amount inverse dot two T because it's a two tailed distribution where we just need the probability, which is the 0.01 and the degrees of freedom, which is the 74. We get the same results of the 2.6439. So that means that if, if our number is between uh, these items in standard deviations, uh, then we, we cannot reject it, right? Which it is, it's in between. So we're saying no uh, rejection here. Okay, let's graph this thing out. So we're going to graph this thing out. And I'm going to use the T's now. So the T's are equivalent to standard deviations. They're like the Z's. If it was a normal distribution, I'm using four of them because four standard deviations would encompass all of our data typically given the fact that two standard deviations should encompass around 95% of the data. Then we're looking at our X's. So I can convert the T's 
which are in essence in standard deviations equivalent to like the Z score if it was a normal distribution to the X's by simply saying that four represents four standard deviations of the graph, which we're using not standard deviations of the population or of the sample, but the standard error. That's what the graph is based on. 278.77 times four should be like negative four would give us the one, 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 five minus the middle point, which is the 9,500 minus the nine, five gives us the eight, three, uh, eight, four, right? And I do that all the way down. That gives us our X's. So that would give us then we have our two X values in terms of X's, which are hours and in terms of standard deviations, which instead of Z's are T's. And then we get our, our calculation for uh, the, the percent, which is gonna be equal to T dot dist of X, which is actually the T and then the degrees of freedom which is once again the 74 and then it's not going to be cumulative therefore zero and then i want the tails which are going to give our critical values meaning i want it to be the if the t is greater than this number and less than this number so i'm graphing the middle part so that means that when i graph this bit it's going to be the whole thing which is actually the blue corners and then i graph the orange on top of it which is going to graph the middle bit, leaving the background of the blue corners uh, for the tails. So how do I calculate that? It's a it's an if function and there's two conditions. So it's an if and so I have if two logic tests. Therefore, I embed an and and say if this T is uh, greater than this number and then and then the next argument is comma and if this T is less than this number right the higher bit then closing up the and back to the if function then what do you want us to do give us that percent if not give us a blank represented by two quotes and a space for a blank space and then it gives us our our number here so if we recap this, we've got then the the this is in terms of X's, which are basically in hours. And this is in terms of uh, the Z's, which are the standard deviations. And the middle point is what we hypothesized uh, to be, which was the 9,500, 9,500. And in terms of Z scores, that would be zero. And we then have the critical values that are way out here because we had a 1% uh, degree uh, alpha and that divided by two means the two tails are way out to the end. So that's gonna be at like the 2.64 uh, and, and on either side in terms of Z's, 2.64 or so right there to do 2.64, which comes out to an equivalent X's or hours of like, 8,736 or so and 10,219 or whatever. And then our number that we actually came to in our test was actually at the 9,464, which is unusual because you would think it would be because our actual data was at 9,007 and we came out to an average, which is actually 9,004, which is actually lower so the actual data was 9,007, which is higher than 9,500. But the sample we took, because it's a sample and samples could vary. And so it was 9,004, which is actually lower. But in any case, it's pretty close to the middle point. It's nowhere near the tails that we would need to get to in order to reject it. And therefore, we're going to most likely have to stick with the 9,500 and say that's pretty good given given our our data here we don't have a preponderance of evidence based on the structure of our analysis here to reject the 9500 now we could get more stringent on this and try to tighten this thing up taking a larger sample increasing alpha you know and so on and so forth uh and you could structure the hypothesis differently thusly but that's the idea